You have your Bibles. We're in the gospel according to Mark, starting with in chapter 2 with verse 1. Word of God says, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above. Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven you. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for trusting us in this space and your word Help us to see Jesus. We want to have an encounter. We want to be next to him. We want to know him. Make that a reality today. Fix us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. A few days later, a few days later, a few days later, Jesus comes home. Uh, he had just finished his tour along the Galilean towns and he was going back home for a little bit of R&R. &R. Somebody say amen if it's nice to hear that Jesus also needs some rest. The humanity of Jesus needing rest, it lets us know that he can identify with us, that he can connect with us, that he gets it. He knows what it's like to be human. So he's there. But when the people had heard that he had come home, they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. Now, you have to understand this is before the advent of social media. So when people showed up where Jesus was, it's because the word of mouth was strong. People were talking. You know who's back, right? <laughs> Jay's back in town. Jesus from Nazareth is back in town. And so the Bible tells us that they packed out the place to the point where there, were no, there was no more room left. Can I just say something? It's an observation. When Jesus is in the house, people pack it out. Do you believe that? When Jesus is in the house, people pack it out. Now look at y'all looking around. Let me tell you something. When we, ever, when we ever have like a numbers issue, it's at our schools or it's in our churches, People like to look at, you know, strategies. They like to, they like to look at uh, um, uh, the finances. They like to look at best practices. And I'm not saying these don't have their part to play in church growth and in growing our schools. But the most important ingredient in any church and any one of our schools is Jesus. When Jesus is in the house. Now, this is not something I'm just you know, just promoting because it sounds good to promote from a position of a pastor. No, I'm saying this because this is the Bible. Jesus tells us, if I am lifted up, I will draw just a few people to my side. Just the very elect. No, the Bible says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all. And this is critical. Glenn, we talked about that uh, last Sunday at the Presbyterian Church. And Glenn is with us, joining us today. It's so good to have you here. If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me, all women to me. I will draw all humankind to me. This is important because when Jesus is central, when Jesus is lifted up, when Jesus is in the house, people show up. I'll never forget how many times I heard this growing up, that the reason why our churches are emptying out is that people cannot take the straight truth. They, they, they can't take the straight gospel. They can't, they can't take the doctrines. They can't take the lasting message. And, 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 they, and they frown upon this, this idea that we are watering down the message by preaching too much Jesus and preaching too much love. L let, me, let me kind of disavow you of this notion. Um, Jesus is love. 
That's what 1 John 4 tells us, that God is love. And we know from John that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things through this Word were created. And in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, This Word became flesh and was the light of all men. Jesus is God, and God is love. You can never preach too much Jesus, and you can never preach too much love. People talk about how we water down the message the more that we speak about love and speak about Jesus. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the undiluted truth from heaven. If you want to concentrate of God, a concentrate of the message from the kingdom of heaven, just talk about Jesus. Doctrines are never the full truth. Doctrines do their best to point us to the truth. Do I need to say that again? Doctrines themselves are never the truth. The truth are not words on a piece of paper. The truth is a person. Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Amen? When we preach Jesus, when we preach love, we are preaching the undiluted gospel. This idea that love somehow is a watered-down version of the truth comes from the enemy himself. Pastor, we need to preach more end time messages. You're absolutely right. Jesus. Pastor, I think we need to preach more doctrines. You're absolutely right. Jesus. Pastor, I believe that if we, if we just focused on the last day message, people would know that we're near the end of time and we have to get ready. You want to get ready? You want to know how to get ready? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, and more Jesus. When he's in the building, when he's in the house, it fills up. So we need to ask ourselves something when we look around. Are we like Jesus? That's the challenge. Are we like Jesus? Not trying to be like Jesus in order for Jesus to accept me. Christ accepted me just the way that I am. But I want to be like Jesus because I'm hoping to draw people to Jesus. Amen? This is why Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We get to be imitators so that people want to be around. There is something attractive about Jesus, and it draws people to him. In fact, you know, one of my favorite authors says that we should not use the events of, of, of calamity and war to, to quicken our conscience and make us try to get ready. She says, Jesus is attractive enough. Jesus is attractive enough. That's why some of us, when we're looking at what's been happening in the world, in the Middle East, many of us are saying, that here it comes. And not just us, there's all kinds of evangelicals. Uh-oh, is this, is this the end? Is this the end? This is what it takes to get people awake? War? What should cause us to wake up is love. We shouldn't need evil to happen in order for us to wake up. Goodness should be inspiring enough. Jesus in the house, the people pack it out. And let me tell you something, this is not just religious folk. There are religious folk there, and we'll find out why. But Jesus attracted everyone. People on the left, people on the right, people blue, people red, people black, people white. Traditional, conservative, liberal, zealots, Sadducees, Pharisees, the Essenes, Jesus attracted all. All of them. And even among his own posse, he had a collection of people from everywhere. They packed out the house. There was no room left. But the Bible tells us that some men came bringing a paralyzed man and they wanted to get to Jesus, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. I, I want to just focus on that just for a little bit here, because as great as Jesus is at attracting people and drawing everyone to him, often the crowd gets in the way. I'm going to keep it real. Sometimes we get in the way of people seeing Jesus. Sometimes we're the crowd. We, we get in the way with our prerequisites, with our judgments, with, with our own prejudice, right? With our own understanding of Scripture. And so we want to make sure that people jump through certain hoops to get to Christ. You know, you, not just anybody can get to him. 
And Jesus constantly broke down these barriers. Even children that weren't allowed to be in adult meetings were around Jesus. And, and the disciples were like, Jesus, stop having these kids treat you like monkey bars. Stop playing freeze tag with them, Jesus. Just stop having them touch you. And Christ is like, no, 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 no. Don't ever discourage children from being around me. Even in that moment, Jesus was announcing to all of his listeners that he's also the director of children's ministries. Jesus is for everyone, right? The young, the old, and everyone in between. We sometimes get in the way, and I just want to say this so that you're not a part of the crowd that gets in the way. Because if you are a part of the crowd that discourages people from coming into the church, if you're a part of the crowd that sets standards so high that people cannot meet them, if you're a part of the crowd that is going to look down on others that don't look like you, dress like you, or like the music that you like, get out of the way. This also goes for you, young folk who think you are so hip that your new way of seeing God and God's love is so great that, that you looked on on everyone else that appears to be too traditional for you. Oh yes, discrimination go the other way as well. Pastor, I, I'm so tired of the hymns and the organ. Why, why can't we just do praise music all the time? Stop it. We talked about this last week, right? And, uh, ageism Awareness Day. We need each other. Young and old, new wine and old wine, amen? New Welches and old Welches. We need each other. Jesus draws everyone, and we will not allow our own prejudice and our sense of, of, of importance to ever get in the way of people seeing Jesus. Because I'm telling you right now, I don't care if you're 75, 85, I've had people in their 90s and come up to me with tears in their eyes and say, oh, that message was for me. Don't be a part of that crowd. If you are, get out of the way, get out of the way. The Bible says they couldn't get to Christ because of the crowd, so they did something that was a little bit aggressive. It says they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Now, I'm going to say something real quick here. This is a little disrespectful. First of all, this ain't your house. And to dig through the roof means that they had to destroy the roof. It wasn't like this was some retractable roof, right? And they pushed a button and it retracted and then they were able to lower their friend down to Jesus. No, 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 no. This was a roof that if you dug through it, you destroyed it. You raised it. That's what that word means, just in case some of y'all didn't get that. <laughs> Little wordplay there. You raised it. You destroyed it. But that's what they felt they needed to do to get to Jesus. So I'm going to say something. I find it a little bit disrespectful. However, it is what happens often in Scripture when people are so persistent, they will not give up, and they'll do whatever it takes to get to God and to get what they want. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews to come timidly before the throne of God. It tells us to come respectfully before the throne of God. What does the Bible say in Hebrews? Come boldly before the throne of God. That's exactly what Abe did. Remember we talked about Abe last week. Remember when he was going back and forth with God? If there's 50 righteous, will you spare Sodom? If there's 45, will you spare it? If there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 20. And he says, yo, I know God, I'm just a human being. And I know that you're God almighty and I'm just a man. And, and, but I'm, 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 going, I'm going to persist if there's 10. People who know God don't give up. They raise the roof. People who know God do what Jacob did, which was totally disrespectful. Ja Jacob was wrestling with who he thought was Esau. So that means there was a brother fight going on, right? Y'all know how brothers fight. I never fought. I just prayed for my brothers. <laughs> and then I gave him the right hand to fellowship. But here's the thing. You know how brothers fight, right? And, and so Jacob was fighting for his life because he believed Esau was trying to kill him. So this is like a fight to the death. So imagine this. Jacob is fighting in order to save his life with someone he believes is his brother. 
But somewhere in the middle of the fight, when God says, let me go and touches his hip and throws it out of joint, Jacob then realizes he's not wrestling with Esau anymore. He knows he's wrestling with God. And do you think Jacob got off of God and said, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I am so sorry. I, I did not mean to UFC you. I am so sorry. I didn't mean to have you in the headlock. I didn't mean to punch you. I am so sorry. Let me fix your beard. Let me comb your hair. Did, did Jacob do any of that? The Bible says he clung even tighter and says, I will not let you go until you what? Until you cry, uncle. Until you bless me, I will not let you go. And what does God do? He cries, uncle. He says, you won. You won. You won, bro. You won. What's your name? <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> He says, not anymore. Your name shall be Israel, for you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed. You want to know what the name Israel means? One who wrestles with God and prevails. Every time they would say the Israelites are coming, they were saying the people who wrestle with their God are on their way. The people who wrestle against their God and prevail are on their way. This idea was so foreign, it didn't make sense. You never wrestled with the gods. You never told the gods what you wanted and what for, the, for them to do. You never had that kind of boldness. But our God says, come, let us reason together. Let's talk about it. What, what do you want? Hey, 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 knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given to you. What father among you, if your, your son asked you for bread, you would give him a rock or give him a snake? If you who are evil know how to give good things, how much more your heavenly father? That's our God. What do you want, Abraham? Well, I was just hoping that maybe, you know, I don't know, there were some good people there. I'm kind of thinking about my nephew and his family. I mean, I mean, God, come on, you got to do better. Like, will you do this for me? I got you, bro. I got you. When you know who God is, you raise the roof. And I'm telling you, we as believers so often, we're so timid. We don't know who we're talking to, who we're praying to, and we just simply give up. Uh, Lord, if you can, I don't know if it's possible, but maybe, uh, you know. Some of you in here know that God answers his promises, that he answers your prayers. Some of you are where you are because of the doors that were open to you, the, 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 the opportunities that you had. And God is willing to even give more. Will his children ask? Will his children raise the roof? Some of you are like, Pastor, you don't understand. Sometimes I don't feel like my prayers get past the roof. I know. I know. Raise it. Raise it. I believe God listens. If my people who are called after my name will what? Humble themselves and pray. And then I will hear from heaven, right? This, these, these are promises that God gives us. And these four men, they were like, we're going to raise this roof. We're going to tear it down because we want to get in front of Jesus. We have a prayer request. Can I say something else I like about this before we go any further? I like that the friends brought their buddy to Jesus because he couldn't do it himself. Praise God for intercessory prayer. Amen? Amen. Praise God for intercessory prayer. Praise God that he is still answering prayers. That sometimes the prayer of the, 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 of the person that you're thinking about and, and concerned about, some of them don't have the faith to pray. Some of them don't know who to pray to. But you know, and so you pray. We learned this last week. Lot would not have made it out of Sodom if Abraham was not praying for him. We continue to pray as a church family. Nothing makes me more upset when a church, a group of believers, thinks that their first response should be anger and more strength, more power. We know what's happening in the Middle East. We know what's happening. And we look on the news and there's people pro-Israel. You go online and you begin to sift through and you find pro-Palestinians and so on and so forth. And people are trying to take sides. Whose side? Whose side? Who should we be praying for? We pray for what God has called us to pray for. 
Well, what's that, pastor? You tell us. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you in the form of a story that I love in the book of Joshua. Joshua is preparing for the battle of Jericho, and he finds, he sees this figure who looks like a, a soldier, a commander, and he says, whose side are you on? And this figure who we know is Jesus Christ, who, who says he's the commander of the Lord's army and who allows Joshua to worship him and remove his sandals. Only God would allow worship, not angels. So this is God himself. This is Jesus, the commander of the heavenly host. And, and he says, whose side are you on? And you want to know what Jesus says to Joshua? He doesn't say I'm on your side. He says, neither. Whose side are you on? Neither. Wait, 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 you're with the good guys, right? I am for everyone. If I am lifted up, I will draw all Israelis, Palestinians, Catholics, Adventists, Presbyterians, Pentecostalists. I will, I will draw everyone. I'm not on your side. I'm not on the, I'm God. You think I care if the Dodgers win the World Series? Don't pray to me about that. I'm not on the Dodgers side. I'm not on the Brave side. I'm not on the Diamondbacks. I'm not. On, I am God. I'm for all of you. I came here for all of you. Our responsibility, brothers and sisters, is not to sit back and say, whose side should we be on? Our responsibility is to pray for life, to pray for peace, to pray for love to prevail. Some of us are just, we, when, are, when are we going to send? We should send more money. We need to bolster our, our army. We need to bolster our armed forces. We need, we need more power and force to be shown. Pastor, did you hear what happened there? Do you know what they're doing to children? We need to act swiftly. We need more force. Do you want to know how the, world, how the war in heaven was resolved? Bible students, how did the war in heaven end? Anybody know? How? When? At the cross. The war in heaven ended at the cross. The war in heaven ended with Jesus dying. That's Bible. That is Bible. The war in heaven didn't happen because God was simply stronger and kicked Satan out. God has never used force. Compelling power is only found in Satan's government, not God's. He uses love. He uses compassion. He uses grace. He uses a, a, a young boy whose father's a carpenter in a, in, a, in a town called Nazareth that people thought was the ghetto. Colossians chapter 1, 19 and 20 says that through the death of Jesus, through his shedding of his blood, that God reconciled everything, whether on earth or in heaven. The war in heaven ended with the death of Jesus Christ. And you want more tanks. And you want more missiles. We should be ashamed of ourselves as believers. Our responsibility is to pray for love, to pray for peace, to be on the side of love and to be on the side of peace. For us to be able to look at both sides and say they both need love, they both need mercy, they both need compassion, they both need to see Jesus. Jesus needs to be in both camps. That's whose side. We're on Jesus' side. I'm not on your side. I'm, not on, I'm on Jesus' side and he is for everyone. If I am lifted up, I will draw and listen, and when he said it, he was in that region, speaking to that local group. Pastor, don't get political. I'm not. I'm being biblical. And we need to be far more biblical when we deal with these issues. I hope your prayers are for everyone. People need to see Jesus. Let's raise the roof. And finally, what happens is the, the Bible says that they lower their friend before Jesus. I love this text. I love this text. It's so beautiful. They lower their friend before Jesus, and it says he sees their faith. <laughs> That's a good word. He sees their faith. It's not that he knows they believe or he looked deep into their heart. He sees their faith. You want to know what their faith looked like? 
Susan, I'm going to tell you what their faith looked like. I'm going to show you what their faith looked like. This is what their faith looked like, Susan. They couldn't even get their prayer request out. They couldn't even ask Jesus for what they wanted. It was this, this. <laughs> Our faith should be that visible. Faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith has substance. Faith can be seen. Faith can be felt. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Often we think of faith as hope. No, hope is hope. Faith is the substance of hope. When people try to talk about the battle between faith and works, faith always has works. Faith always looks like Jesus in a headlock. Faith always looks like us going back and forth and saying, Lord, if there's not, you know, 20, how about 10? Faith always has us out of breath. Faith always has us reaching out and grabbing the hem of his garment. Faith has always had works. That's why James says, what, what good is it if you're going to say you believe and yet the homeless person goes hungry? That's not faith. You just simply hope they find a meal one day. Oh boy, if we read our Bibles, you would know that most of us can answer our own prayers with some faith. Not hope, faith. Oh, Father, Father God. Oh, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, Lord, just be in that hungry man's life right now. Just bless him. Give him a meal today. And God is like, uh, turn the car around. Well, no, I'm going to miss my movie time if I turn it around right now. So I'm just going to pray. Lord, you told me to pray. Yeah, I I'm telling you to pray. In fact, I I I'd like you to use less words and more action. They say that communication, 90% of it is nonverbal. If that's the case, our prayers should have less words and more action. Amen? Right? Jesus saw their faith. Watch this. He saw their prayer request. They never opened their mouth. Not once. And then Jesus says to them, says to the brother, your sins are forgiven you. Why did the four men bring their friend to Jesus? To do what? Heal him, right? Fix him. Yet Jesus says your sins are forgiven. Almost like Jesus did not read the room, right? <laughs> They're out of breath. They tore apart the roof. They bring down the paralytic. Everybody's standing back. They're like, oh, I've heard he can do this. <laughs> I've heard he can fix this guy. Ooh, they pull out their phones, right? They're, 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 this, is, this is IG Live. I mean, they're, they're ready for this. And Jesus just looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven you, brother. Sins are forgiven. Thanks for coming. Wait. But Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, they want you to fix him. Yeah, I know. Your sins are forgiven you. No, I mean like fix, fix him. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm fix, fixing him right now. Uh, your sins are forgiven you. Now, the haters around are like, wait a second. Um... You are just a man. Only God can forgive sins. So this is blasphemy. Jesus turns to them and says, why are you thinking these things? Why are you thinking these things? What do you think is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say get up, pick up your bed and walk? Question. What do you think is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to get up, pick up and walk? What is easier? For Jesus, what is easier? For Jesus to tell this man to get up, pick up, and walk, he doesn't even have to break a sweat. Yo, get up. I'm the creator. I just got to speak a word. But to forgive us of sins, he'd have to break a bloody sweat. Right? To say your sins are forgiven, Jesus, it would cost him his life. There is no greater miracle than your sins are forgiven. Many of us are still angry with God because he did not heal our child at six years old. He did not heal our spouse. They died prematurely of cancer. He allowed this evil to happen in the Middle East. How could he allow this to happen to children, innocent people? God, you don't care. Where's the miracles? Why aren't you protecting us? And he says, I have. 
your sins are forgiven. I know, okay, yeah, that's, thank you, your love, your grace, but I mean like real stuff. <laughs> Jesus is like, no, 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 you, you're missing the point. You don't realize what you want me to do right now is put a band-aid on your situation. Because you're going to die. If it's not from cancer, you're going to die of old age. I can put a band-aid on it. I can give you some meds to keep you up a little bit longer. But, but, but what I want to solve is not your temporary issue. I want to solve your eternal issue. You want me to deal with the symptoms of sin, and I want to deal with the issue of sin. What's really happening right now? What's going on the inside? I want to get to the heart of the issue. I want to cure you of sin. And you just want me to take care of your cough. You just want a bigger house. You want to see your marriage restored. I want all those things for you, but I want to first and foremost let you know what's most important to me is to heal your heart. My brother, my sister, your sins are forgiven you. Now, this is the way Jesus does it. I, you know, Jesus is smooth. You know that, right? And we're closing on this. He decided <laughs> to prove a situation by performing a miracle. He says to prove to you <clears throat> that I have the power and the authority to forgive sins. He then turns to the brother and says, get up, pick up your bed and walk. To prove to you that I have the authority to forgive you of sin. <clears throat> to count you as righteous. To count you as perfect, to count you as deserving and worthy, to prove to you that I have the authority to justify you and to sanctify you, to prove to you that I have this authority, I'm going to do the easy part. <laughs> Get up, pick up, and walk. The miracles that God performs in your life today, let me tell you something. I, I have had, I've had grandparents that lived longer because God has did, some, did something miraculous. I, I, I know of people that shouldn't be here right now that are alive. I know people, I've seen marriages that have been restored because of the grace of God. Miracles, miracles, miracles. I've seen the miracles happen, but those miracles are just proving that Jesus has the authority to restore your heart to forgive you of sins. Every single miracle you ever see is pointing us back to the major miracle, the most important miracle. I forgive you. And that's the miracle he's given us the privilege to give to everyone even now. You wanna see a miracle today in this church? There's someone you need to forgive. You wanna see a miracle in this country and in other countries? Forgive the Israelis. Forgive the Palestinians. Forgive Saddam Hussein. Forgive ISIS, Hamas. Forgive Hitler. Forgive apartheid. Forgive racism, sexism. Forgive infidelity, adultery. Forgive hate. Forgive denominationalism. Segregation. You want to see a miracle? You want God to fix you? He forgives you. Raise the roof. Perform the miracle that the world needs and never gets tired of receiving. Forgive your brother. Forgive your sister. <clears throat> we want to pray for them, Father. Yes. You want to do something amazing? Pray for the relief effort in Gaza and pray for the relief effort in Israel and send money to both. <gasps> but, Pastor, we have to choose a side. We do. We forgive them. We forgive them. We're on the side of life, hearts being restored. We raise the roof. Maybe we cancel our vacation and that money that was going towards the vacation becomes a prayer request that has legs, has meat, it, it's out of breath. It 
goes to organizations that are right there, people who are willing to risk their lives right now in war-torn countries with missiles flying around, and they have left their families in order to help those in need. And they're not choosing a side, they're simply choosing life. And I'm telling you right now, they are more like Jesus than many of us in these pews. I forgive you. I forgive myself. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to be more reflective. In this one story, we see four pillars of, of emphasis in your ministry. We see a teaching on prayer. Father, we see the teaching of miracles. We see the teaching of faith, faith that can be seen. And we see the teaching of forgiveness. All in this beautiful story. May it change our hearts. Because this is what matters most. And may we begin to heal this world one heart at a time. Father, challenge this church what we must do for what's happening in this world right now. May our prayers have legs. May our prayers be out of breath. May our prayers have action. May they have substance. If there's a way we can contribute, Father, make that so known to us so that we can be on the side of life. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Help us to forgive others the way that you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen.